Well, hi, my name's Gordon Palmer, I'm minister here at Clement Parish Church, and this is our service for Sunday the 23rd of May. We welcome you to our service. It's Pentecost Sunday. We remember on Pente at Pentecost how the Spirit was given to the church just as Jesus had promised. It's not going to be our theme for the whole service. For just a few weeks ago after Easter, we had a series on what happened next. After the resurrection, there was Jesus ascending. There was the gift of the Spirit. And we looked also forward to the promise of Jesus' return. But while it's not the theme for our whole service, we realize, we recognize, we affirm that we cannot do anything unless God's Holy Spirit is with and among us. And so on this Pentecost Sunday, we um, pause to acknowledge and affirm that. May the joyful Spirit of God then, bursting with the, bright, the brightness of flame in, into the coldness of our lives, warm us with a passion for mission, for justice and beauty. May the joyful, mighty Spirit of God, sweeping us out of the dusty corners of our indifference and breathe vitality into our search for holiness. And may the gracious Spirit of God, speaking words that leap over barriers of mistrust, bring to us messages of truth and new light. All over the world, the Spirit is moving. Let us praise God. Let us pray and we'll gather up our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer. The words for the Lord's Prayer will appear on the screen. Let us pray. Psalmist declares that the heavens are telling the glory of God. The wonder of his work displays the firmament. How can we, Lord God, give you praise that is worthy of you? How can we sum up what you mean to us, what you are in your glory and majesty? How can we dare try to describe, to pin down the beauty of fellowship with you? But Lord God, you've given on your people the gift of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit to lift us up to praise you. So come and fill and thrill us with a sense of our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Fill us with that sense of who you are, how much you love, and indeed how privileged we are. We thank you for the gift of your Spirit who brings the Word of God to life in our lives. Through your Spirit, keep us from dry routine. Keep us from going through the motions, and may our worship live. May our worship live, not just our worship that we do in a service, but the worship that too that we do in service in the world, in our daily walk with you. May our worship 
find glimpses of the Holy God, of Christ, the sender of the Spirit, and we find the presence of the Spirit coming to us and being with us and among us, even in unexpected ways and places. Lord, as we come before you, we call to mind our sin and the presence of you, a pardoning God. In our confession with sorrow, may we meet forgiveness being poured out on us. And may our weakness be filled by strength from beyond our own resources as the Holy Spirit leads us to follow Jesus' way in faith and commitment. Lord, through your Spirit, may we be forgiven people, renewed, restored, and revived, declaring that our God lives, our God is active, our God cares, our God is involved, our God is good news. And we offer these prayers in the name of Jesus, the Jesus who promised and kept that promise of the Spirit given to his people. And we, offer, and we pray together in his words. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be you. Today we are going to read from the fourth chapter of the book of James and also verses 1 to 6 of the fifth chapter of James. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he caused to dwell within us? But he gives us more grace. That's why scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favour to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, one who's able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbour? Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. 
you have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves on the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Well, I expect most of us have had an experience like this when you've been with a number of folk in, in quite a busy room for a while and then you've had to go out the room for some reason. Maybe you've gone to answer the door or gone to see something in the kitchen, maybe you've gone to the loo. And after you've been away for a wee while, you come back in and as you open the, the door and go back into the room, suddenly you realise, gosh, it's hot in here. Now, did it get hot the uh, two minutes that you were out the room? No, it was getting warmer all the time and you, you didn't notice it just because it was happening bit by bit. It was gradual. I'm told that if you um, put a frog in a pan of water and heat it very gently, the frog doesn't realise that's what's happening and will stay in the pan of water even until it's bo boiled to death. Um, sorry, that's not a very pleasant illustration and, and don't try that at home. Um, well, not unless you've got a couple of French friends coming for lunch. Things changing gradually tend not to be noticed. Something that's there all the time we accept and we get used to it. And that's true of way, ways of life as well. If, if we're used to something, we just kind of accept it. Um, there were a few brothers who used to visit us um, in our house when we lived in Rochese. And one day, uh, one of them followed Karen into the kitchen. He would have been about... 10 years old at the time, and he followed Karen into the kitchen and said to her, Karen, what do you do when Mr. Palmer hits you? Do you hit him back or do you phone the police? About a decade before that, I was in Glasgow's other ruch. I was in Ruch Hill doing, doing youth work and, and came across uh, women who were very upset if, or a bit worried at least, if they didn't get hit by their man on a Friday night. You see, it's what happened. The guy got paid on a Friday. He went out and got drunk. And when he came home, he battered his wife or his partner. And, and if the woman didn't get beaten, um, sometimes they thought, oh, I wonder if he's seeing somebody else. Is he hitting somebody else and not me? It took me a while just to get my head around that. But you see, when people are used to things, then they don't notice how awful or how difficult it seems to, to somebody else. There's much, much being made at the moment about statues and, and street names of folks that were, were done to honour folks who um, were benefactors, but yes, but whose largesse came from proceeds that they'd made in the slave trade. Now, I'm not wanting to excuse anyone who was involved in the slave trade, but we should remember there was a time when it was taken for granted. People were not horrified by it. We might say this similar over the years about different attitudes to warfare, or we're very aware today of different attitudes to issues of, of sexuality and, and gender. And through all of these, there, there comes some kind of sense of this, this is the way it is. This is the way people see things. This is the way these things are. Now, our series of James and James is looking at a number of tests to see that we're in, the, in Christ. He first of all talked about our response to trials and temptations, whether our love for God is greater than the circumstances of our life. The second test was how we respond to Scripture, God's Word. If we love Jesus, we'll love what He's saying to us. We'll love His words and want more of it. And the third test was whether our lifestyle shows signs that we are following Christ. And now in chapter 4 the, the, and into chapter 5, the question, the, the test is whether we are resisting the ways of the world that are ungodly, whether we're being guided by God's standards, or whether we're just accepting whatever it is that's around us. There are, there are some occasions, there are some things in life where you can have it both ways. You know, maybe going out for a, for a meal. Do you want meat or would you like fish? Well, you can order surf and turf and have a bit of both. My next car could be one that runs in both electricity and petrol. 
But there are times we, we can have both. If I take my hybrid car and go out to the M8 and say I'm going to drive to the end, end of the M8, then either I'm driving to Greenock or I'm driving to Edinburgh. And I can't drive to the M8 and think, oh, well, I want a bit of each, you know, a wee bit of Greenock and a wee bit of Edinburgh mixed together. No, it's one or the other. And Jesus was clear that when following him, it was one or the other. It was his way or the world's way. Jesus said to his followers, John 15, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. The choice was stark. Matthew 12, he says, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. No middle ground. No a bit of both. Jesus doesn't do a faith version of surf and turf. Years before, Elijah had confronted the people of Israel who were swithering between following God or the, just going along with the crowd and following the prevalent view of their time, the, the God Baal. And Elijah went, we're told in 1 Kings 18, Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And now James is saying the same thing to the church. You cannot follow God and Satan. You cannot be following Jesus and going along with whatever the world says. And he picks out two areas where there's a clash, two areas that are so basic and so fundamental that they're issues, not just in James' time, but still issues in our time, and indeed have been issues in all the years in between. The first of the two issues that he picks out is an attitude towards power in the first 12 verses of chapter 4. And he begins that but with the observation that there's conflicts going on in the church. Now, there shouldn't be, and we know that there shouldn't be. Um, but pretty often, too often, there are. How does that happen? Why has that row broken out? How come you two are not getting along? How come I can hear some angry shouts? Why did you ignore him or her? And before any of us start down the road of explaining how we've been offended, how the other person is at fault, James points out that our, des our desires play a big part in this, verses 1 and 2. It might be our wanting our own way. It might be our need to be noticed or our need to be thanked or approved of. It might be that we're greedy or we need to be right all the time. But these are what the world does, says James, verse 4. And it should be very different among Jesus' followers. He runs quickly through a number of attitudes that we should have. Submit yourselves then to God, he says, verse 7. So when I am caught up in a row... When I am thinking, how am I going to get my own way here? How can, I, how can I have this so that the outcome is something that suits me? I should be asking myself, is this what God wants? It's what I'm trying to do here. It's what I'm saying. It's what I'm thinking. It's what I'm trying to maneuver into being. Is this something that pleases the Heavenly Father? Am I considering whether or not he is pleased with me. It was one of the most humbling experiences of life when as the parent of young children, I would see one of them do something that I just thought, oh, no, that's terrible. What a way to behave. And then in the very next moment, I realized where they'd got it from. They'd got it from me. But I remember the disappointment and seeing something thinking, oh, no, that's terrible. Well, God sees that. God feels like that. So that's why he, James says, submit to God. It's not behavior if it, that we get from God if it's not of him. But he's just as sore, just as disappointed to see it among his people. And yet sometimes we just bash on with the, the rouse or the conflict or wanting away because the power thing. And as well as submit to God, verse 7, he says, resist the devil. For not only is the longing to get our way at all costs something that hurts our heavenly Father, it also has the enemy rubbing his hands with delight. 
Just as the, de the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness, so he will t try to distract us, to trip us up. And he's so pleased when he pulls it off. He doesn't leave us alone. You might remember in that passage that we, we looked at in Jesus being tempted in the, the wilderness in Luke chapter 4, it said not just that there were the three temptations, but he was tempted throughout his time there. The devil doesn't take days off. He's always trying to trick us up, trip us up. He's always trying to trick us, to find us out. And we need to resist. And then James says, after submit to God and resist the devil, he says, verse 8, come near to God. Because it's not just that there are some rules that we have to submit to and obey. God longs for us to have fellowship with him. And we cannot come near to God if we are doing what he detests. And James says that he will turn to us if we turn to him. It's like the story of the, the lost son in Luke 15, where, you know, the prodigal has been away for years and he's spent the father's money and he's wasted it all. And he, he goes, starts to go home and he's trying to think of all the excuses and how he's going to put it. But instead, the father rushes out to greet him. That's what our God is like. So James says, come, come near to God and he will come near to you, verse 8. And he tells us, verse 9, to grieve and mourn and wail. That is, our, there should be a sense of our sin upsetting us because we've disappointed the Father. Again, just like the lost son in, that, in the story in Luke 15. Our sin should be a source of hurt and upset, not because we feel bad about it, but because we've let God down. And it's only as we recognize who we are, sinners, and over as we, only as we grieve over that, that, uh, that we discover what it means for God to draw near to us. God, godly grief over our sin is where our turning to Him begins. But it's not where He leaves us. He will, verse 10, lift you up. And so in our world which says, me first, in our world, it tells you that you must affirm yourself, that you deserve this and that and the next thing. The way of Jesus clashes with that. Self-worth in, in our society is by bigging ourselves up, our taking, our dominating, our getting what we want. Worth is measured by possessions. Happiness is seen as a function of wealth. But Jesus says the exact opposite. He says the last will be first. He says giving is better than getting. He says if you want to be lifted up, verse 10 in James, first be humbled. So we can't surf and turf. We can't have a bit of both, a bit of Jesus and the world. It is either Jesus or the devil. We are either for Jesus or against him. Now what the world says is kind of all around us all the time. It's like being in the, the room that was heating up gradually. We're just surrounded by something and, and we don't notice it because it's there. Well, if we're going to follow Jesus, we have to start taking notice. We have to learn to identify what's not of Christ. And so if we don't watch and if we don't give permission to other believers to watch us, then we are just like those who don't notice the room heating up. We don't know the, notice the world's values creeping more and more into our lives. So test yourself, says James. Because if we don't, we fall just into the very same traps, verses 1 to 4, as the world's in. Well, that's his first example about power, about me first, about getting rather than giving. The second one from um, chapter, uh, from verse 13, sorry, to uh, verse 6 of chapter 5 is about our wealth, our self-sufficiency. We get more, says James. And then verses 2 and 3 in chapter 5, we hoard more. We get more and we, verse 4 of chapter 5, defend injustice. We get more, we become extravagant, verse 5. That's right, isn't it? We hoard. How many attics are there in people's houses in East Bride? How many lockups are there throughout the town that are filled with stuff and stuff that people are not going to use again? 
We have more clothes than we are ever going to be able to wear, more books than we can read, cups and saucers that we never use, more DVDs than we will ever watch again, and so on and so on. And then people hoard to the extent that they have so much, a bigger house and everything else, they have to put bigger fences and security cameras and everything else, protecting, because we're hoarding. And then injustice, verse um, <clears throat> sorry, verse 4. Something, incidentally, which has got a lot worse, I think, during lockdown. How much more available is the vaccine in rich countries as compared with poor countries? Some folks have made lots of money out of the lockdown. Maybe they've got a, a business or a product like Zoom or delivery drivers that was just right for the occasion. Maybe they know the right politician's ear to, to whisper in. Well, maybe I'm not allowed to say that kind of thing, but let's face it, it's been going on and it's been shameful and awful. And it's unjust and unfair. It's what happens. Wealth says get more, get more, and we don't mind bending or disregarding the rules. And our wealth helps us not to notice. Our wealth means that we can build so much around us that takes up our time and attention and everything else that we don't see injustice. We don't see the un unfairness of it unless we make specific attempts to look. Extravagance, verse 5, our society finds more and more ways to spend, more and more things to spend on. And again, we all have our blind spots here, and they're different blind spots. And our notions of other people's, well, that's a waste of money, um, is not necessarily what they think of ours. And we find ways to justify our own indulgence. But in the kingdom of God, wealth is used to bless others. Wealth is used to minister in Jesus' name. It's not used for more luxury items, more luxury treatments, more bigger and over-the-top events and so on. Now, it's so easy to, to read James' word, words about self-indulgence and luxury in verse 5 and think, oh, that must be, that must be for somebody else. You know, it's probably for these, you know, rich sports stars who have got agents arguing about whether they're going to get paid £400,000 a week rather than £350,000 a week. These guys, they, these are the ones with huge luxury and extravagance. Me? But that's another trick of the devil. We have to measure ourselves not against the world standards. It's no, no defense to say, well, at least I'm not as extravagant as so-and-so. Simple fact is there are billions of people in this world that I would be so incredibly embarrassed if they were lifted out of where they were and dropped into our house and, and saw everything that's in our house. I would, I would be embarrassed. I would be ashamed. I, I would be stumbling and struggling for, for words just to explain to them why I've got so much. And I didn't maybe set out to have that much, but, you know, things creep, on it, on it, creep up on us bit by bit. And things that we once thought of as a privilege become an entitlement. You see, if we're followers of Jesus, we need to find ways in which we are discerning about that kind of thing. Seeing what's going on. Now, that's not easy. It's not sorted by one decision or one action. That's one reason that we need to keep meeting together. We need to keep helping one another. We need to keep sharing with one another. Because every day in life, there is a world-based emphasis with powerful machinery of advertising, with huge peer pressure and so on, all pulling us in a world's direction, not a Jesus direction. And very often, it's subtle about it. Very often, it creeps up on us. But then sometimes also it's screaming out at us, suggesting everybody's like this, everybody sees it this way. And it's a lie. And if we truly are Christ's, 
then we will want to know how best we can resist that, how best we can embrace his countercultural way. Now, the test is not whether or not we have perfectly consistent lives. None of us do. We will drive ourselves crazy if, we, if that's the standard, trying to dot every I and cross every T. No, the test is whether or not we're seeking to follow Jesus, whether or not we're saying, what is a Jesus way here? Do I really need to do this? Do I really need to grab this? Do I really need to affirm and assert myself over that person? Do I really need to get the last word? Do I really need to have this new coat? Do I really need to? The test is whether or not we don't just do these things unthinkingly, but whether we're seeking to follow Jesus, which will mean amongst other things, a concern to be faithful in, in all things, a concern to go against the flow, a concern to make known not just a different way, but a better way. Abundant life. That's what Jesus promised. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray that you will help us not to dodge the implications, not to dodge the challenges of your word. So often we prefer it when it's a, a nice promise that we can lay hold on, when it's something that sounds comforting. And Lord, yes, these words are words from you, but also so too are the words that prick our conscience, so too are the words which challenge us, so too are the words which, as we were looking at a few weeks ago, just hold up, as it were, a mirror before us. So help us to take a good, honest look and not to turn away forgetting what, it's, what it says to us, but to changing our ways and our lifestyle, that it might be more and more according to the way of Christ and not just going with the flow. We need help to do that. We need your Holy Spirit given at Pentecost with, with us, strengthening our resolve, guiding us and giving us discernment. God of grace, help us for your glory. Amen. Now, a hymn which speaks both of the work and the challenge and the call for us to put Jesus into, into action, but also our dependence on the, the Holy Spirit in doing that. Oh, church arise and put your armor on. After we've uh, had that hymn, we'll uh, confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. And then Morag Drumgold will be um, <clears throat> leading us in our prayers for others. After Morag has led us in prayer, we'll conclude our service by singing the hymn, Praise the Spirit in Creation. Again, honoring the fact that God, through His Holy Spirit, has been involved in creation and all through time and will, will bring us to the kingdom at the end. But firstly, the hymn, O Church, Arise and Put Your Armour On. O Church, arise and put your armour on. Hear the call of Christ our Captain. For now the weak can say,
I believe in God the Father, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died and was buried. He descended into the dead. I believe in the Lord. Let's pray together. Loving, gracious God, we thank you for this day and every day you've given us. We are so grateful that you, the creator of everything, love us, want us, wait patiently for us to come to you and forgive us all our shortcomings because you are our loving father watching over us always and hearing our prayers. Father, today as we pray for your world, there are so many we want to bring before you. We have watched in horror and dismay in recent days the carnage happening in Israel and Palestine, in places whose names we know so well, even if we've never been there, Jerusalem, Beersheba, Nazareth, and many others. We see the descendants you promised your friend Abraham tearing each other apart, in the place where you chose to plant the first seeds of your church. Lord, we pray for the innocents caught up in this turmoil, especially the children. We pray too for the opposing factions who seem to be unable or unwilling to listen to each other. And we pray for the peacemakers and ask that you will be with them and that their efforts will be successful. Dear God, we thank you that over the last 10 days, we have had the privilege of being part of the global wave of prayer through thy kingdom come. Global, how amazing. Folk all over the world reading and praying the same things on the same day, no matter when the sun rose or set in their particular place. All of us adding our own prayers for the people in our lives who don't yet have Jesus in theirs. Father, we bring before you now every person who has been lifted up to you during this time, knowing that you have heard our prayers and asking that every one of those prayed for will know the presence and power of Jesus in their lives. We pray for governments here and across the world, that they will work together to overcome many problems, the pandemic, poverty, unrest, injustice and environment, environmental issues. We pray for wisdom, compassion and unity in all their decisions. We continue to pray for an end to the coronavirus pandemic, even if we must accept that COVID will be with us for a very long time. We pray for all those working tirelessly to develop, improve and produce safe, effective vaccines. 
Lord, we ask that countries, particularly in the Western world, will follow the lead of France and make a commitment to provide a percentage of their vaccines to places where they are already running out or where there has never been any available. And as restrictions ease here, we pray for caution and common sense to prevail in everything we do. We pray, Father, for healing for the sick and suffering and for comfort for those who are mourning. May they all know your peace. We pray for your church here in Claremont and the community of which we're part. We are so happy that we can once again meet together in worship, albeit in a different way, hopeful that this is a stepping stone towards larger gatherings in the days ahead. We know that some much-loved folk will be missing when we eventually do come together, but we are comforted knowing that they are resting in peace now with you until the day that you raise them up once again. We thank you for our ministry team and our ongoing online ministry, which have served us so well and kept us together while apart. Father, help us to realise we all have a part to play in ministering to each other, to families, friends and neighbours, and to being and making disciples for Jesus. Help us please to overcome temptation so that we can maintain a closer relationship with you. Help us please to overcome selfishness so that we can live in harmony with those around us. On this day of Pentecost, this day of the Spirit, we pray that the Spirit who you left with us here until the work is done will work in us and through us so that every part of our life and the way we live it will shine like a spotlight in Jesus for everyone to see. And in his precious name we pray. Amen.